Hi everyone, my name is Niels and in today's video I would like to go over the slides that I made for a recent uh, presentation at the Belgian NLP meetup uh, where I talked about training and deploying open source uh, large language models because yeah, 2023 has been a really exciting year for open source AI there were a huge amount of models being released on the Hugging Face Hub um, so you can find all of them here uh, and yeah, a lot of um, open source large language models were released uh, lately. For example, there was the Phi2 uh, model from Microsoft, uh, which is a small language model that could be run on uh, edge devices. There was the Mixer model from uh, Missile.ai. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of exciting developments. And um, yeah, I just want to explain a bit like how you could uh, take one of these models and then train them basically fine tune them on your own custom data and then deploy them uh, yourself. So uh, yeah, as a brief overview here, uh, I will first talk a bit about the rise of all of these open models and then yeah, how you can fine tune them on your own data, how you can deploy them. Uh, I will also talk a bit about the advantages versus disadvantages of an open source model uh, over a closed source solution like GPT-4, for example. Uh, and I'll also uh, talk a bit about some exciting develop developments that we might see in the near uh, future. But so regarding the rise of these open models, um, so yeah, there were a huge amount of uh, models being released uh, last year. It all started with the um, Llama model from uh, Meta in 2023, uh, which at the time was one of the best performing uh, openly available uh, large language models. Um, so this one, didn't have like uh, commercial uh, allowances so people couldn't use it for commercial purposes but it was an openly available model so people could uh, download this model on their own laptop and start fine-tuning them and this is what a lot of people did so then there were a lot of other animals uh, that started to pop up like alpacas, vicunas, koalas, guanaco which was another fine-tuned version of llama um, by Tim Detmers uh, who has developed uh, a lot of uh, clever quantization techniques to make these uh, models smaller. Uh, there was the star coder and star chat models from Hugging Face, which are open source versions of GitHub Copilot. There was the MPT series from Mosaic ML, uh, which were also exciting open source uh, models, which were released on Hugging Face. Uh, there was the Falcon series. There was the Phi uh, models from Microsoft, uh, which are yeah, on the other side of the spectrum, these are small language models, which could eventually be run uh, on your iPhone. And then in July, Meta released their follow-up version of Llama called Llama 2, which uh, has a, a commercial allowances, so people could use it for commercial purposes. Um, and then there was the Mistral uh, 7B model, which yeah was a really exciting development because so Mistral.ai is a uh french startup based in paris they are a U european competitor uh, to openai and they release also quite some models uh, openly available so the first model was called mistral 7b so it was and probably still is one of the best performing 7 billion parameter models uh, and then yeah in december they also released their mixtral 8 times 7 b model which has a mixture of experts architecture uh, similar to GPT-4 and so yeah you can find all of these models uh, just on Hugging Face so you can go ahead and just start downloading uh, the PyTorch weights for example and train them on your own data. Uh, so yeah a lot of exciting developments and we might probably see a lot of these as well in 2024. Um, and so, yeah, of course, given all of these models, it might become difficult to know like which ones are performing the best. Uh, so I have a few recommendations on like how you can determine the current best models. Uh, one big effort is the open LLM leaderboards by Hugging Face, uh, yeah, which um, basically tries to rank all of these models by benchmarking them on a few uh, different data sets like MMLU uh, and Truthful QA and so on. Uh, and so these data sets, they basically um, benchmark them on uh, a lot of reasoning um, problems, 
uh, a lot of high school questions involved as well. Uh, and so based on that, we can actually calculate a score because I think most of these data sets are multiple choice questions. So it's basically as if these models are um, uh, being asked to fill in an exam just as a student. Uh, and so based on that, we can calculate uh, the average scores. And so it also nicely allows you to filter uh, on the different model sizes uh, in terms of billions of parameters. You can filter on the precision, uh, which basically means like um, how the parameters are stored, whether they are stored in 16 bit bits or 8 bits or 4 bits. Uh, yeah, this is called quantization, uh, meaning that we try to shrink down the size of these models. And you can also filter on whether yeah, you only want to filter on pre-trained models or whether you also want to uh, filter instruction tuned versions, for example. But of course, yeah, this is just one way of evaluating models. Uh, some people have criticized this leaderboard uh, because yeah, it's just benchmarking on these few different uh, reasoning and common sense uh, benchmarks. Um, and that's why my second recommendation is the chatbot arena developed by LMCs. So the chatbot arena is a very nice way uh, of yeah, basically using humans uh, to rank these models. So it's basically a game arena where you always have uh, two large language models playing against each other. Um, and so each game consists of a human giving a certain prompt, like for example, list me a few models available in the Transformers library. Um, and so then you basically see the completions of two different models, but it's a blind test, so we don't really see here what model A and model B are. We just see their completions. Uh, and based on that, a human can then pick which uh, of the two completions he preferred. Um, and so then you could say that that model wins the game. Um, and based on that, one can calculate the ELO rating. So an ELO rating is something that is often used in chess to rank uh, and rate chess players based on the number of games they win. Um, and so, yeah, this is a very nice way of evaluating uh, and ranking these models. And so, as you can see here, most of the top performing models here are closed source versions. Uh, but nowadays, we already have, for example, this openly available Mixtral model from Mistral, and it's already being preferred over uh, closed source models like Gemini Pro by Google and GPT 3.5 Turbo by OpenAI, as well as Cloud 2.1, uh, which is a model from Anthropic, which is another OpenAI competitor. Uh, and yeah, the final ranking here is actually a average of the ELO rating, but also the score on MMLU, which is also one of these data sets that is used in the Open LLM leaderboard from Hugging Face, as well as the empty bench score, which is another benchmark for large language models. So yeah, in this case, for example, we see the two completions here. Um, and in this case, I'm going to, well, I'm going to give the uh, win to model B. So in this case, for example, you can see that uh, it was actually a game between Claude 2.1 from Entropic against GPT-4. So yeah, this is a nice way of evaluating models for sure. And so, yeah, every few months, uh, yeah, they, they update their leaderboards. And so, yeah, for example, when Mixtral was released, it was already rivaling uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And if you now take a look at the leaderboard, it's actually already being preferred uh, over GPT 3.5. So that's quite exciting to see. So, yeah, this figure nicely summarizes uh, this battle, basically, that we have between open source models and closed source models. Uh, and we actually see this gap becoming smaller and smaller over time. Uh, so like if you compare uh, the gap between open source and closed source models uh, in the beginning of 2023 for versus the end, uh, we have seen actually that this gap has become way, way smaller. And yeah, I expect this to become even smaller in the near future, giving uh, people yeah a lot of options to go for an open source model uh, because it also comes with uh, a lot of advantages, such as data privacy. There is no sensitive data being sent to another party. 
So yeah, that was about about the rise of these open uh, large language models. Now, uh, let's say you want to go ahead and train one of these models. How how to do this? Well, uh, this is a nice figure that I took from uh, Andre Carpati from one of his uh, recent talks. And uh, basically, creating your own GPT assistant consists of uh, four different steps. Nowadays, you could say three different steps. The first one is pre-training. The second one is supervised fine tuning or SFT for short. And yeah, I'm going to take these two steps here as one. The third step is called human preference training. Um, and I will go uh, over these three big steps in the next few slides. So the first step is pre-training. So in the pre-training stage, we simply ask the model to predict the next token, next word, basically based on the previous words. And we do, do this on a huge amount of text that we collected from the internet. So we basically just collect basically all the web pages that exist uh, on the web. We, of course, also filter them uh, to only get like high quality web pages. Um, and then, and yeah, this is why it's only feasible to do this uh, by some large organizations like OpenAI and Meta, because this is typically done on clusters of GPUs. Uh, because yeah, as, as there are, uh, is so much data available and the size of these models is so large. Uh, so for reference, uh, GPT-4, for example, was pre-trained on a cluster of 25,000 GPUs for about 100 days. Uh, so that's why OpenAI has this partnership with uh, Microsoft for their Azure platform. It's to get access to all of these uh, GPUs. So th these are then typically NVIDIA GPUs like A100s or H100s. Uh, so yeah, this is an operation that costs uh, millions to hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so yeah, the main reason why we do this pre-training step is basically to get the model, uh, to get its, its common sense knowledge about the world, to basically uh, obtain a lot of knowledge around language in general, because yeah, asking a model to predict the next word actually requires to to have quite uh, a bit of understanding of, of the world. Uh, well, there is some discussion around uh, whether this is very shallow knowledge, as for example, Jan LeCun uh, is often uh, saying. But yeah, this is typically uh, just done to, to make the model get a lot of uh, world knowledge. And so the output of this is what we call a base model. So a base model is nothing but a model that has been pre-trained on a huge amount of text uh, where it was asked to predict the next token. So once we have this base model, the second step is the supervised fine tuning stage or SFT for short. So in this step, we basically take the base model and turn it into a chatbot, into a useful assistant. Because uh, yeah, if we take this base model from the first step, this model will be uh, very good at predicting the next words. But of course, that's only like, uh, a pre-training objective, this is not really useful, uh, for example, if you want to make a chatbot. Uh, because if we have a chatbot, then we want it to generate useful completions given certain instructions. And that's exactly what this second step does. So basically, we require to, to collect some label data here. We collect pairs of human instructions together with the completions that we wanted to generate. Um, so this is typically uh, gathered from humans. So, for example, OpenAI, they, uh, they hired human contractors to generate useful completions for instructions like, for example, uh, list me 10 things to do in London, or um, could you please write me a, a recipe for pancakes, or for example, write me a poem about elephants, uh, could be anything, but we always have these pairs of a human instruction and then the completion that we want the model to generate. So for that, you need a labeled data set. And so one example of such a labeled data set is the UltraChat 200K data set, which you can also find on Hugging Face. Uh, so this is a collection of 200,000 uh, human instructions, like for example, which famous landmarks should I visit in London beyond the usual ones? Uh, and then this is the completion that we want the model to generate. And that's what we are going to train the model on. So that's the supervised fine tuning stage. Um, and so contrary to the pre-training step, this is actually doable uh, like for people like me uh, who just want to fine tune these models on our own uh, laptop or our own system. 
Uh, you typically require uh, one or multiple GPUs for this. So yeah, actually I wouldn't recommend to do this on your own laptop, but you can uh, easily uh, get one or few GPUs from cloud providers, like for example, RunPod, uh, Vast.ai, Lambda Labs. These are all uh, cloud providers, which yeah, give you access to uh, GPUs if you pay for them. Uh, and yeah, they typically have both on-demand pricing where you are uh, paying for a dedicated instance. So you basically get a virtual machine with a GPU and it's only being assigned to you. And then they also have uh, interruptible pricing, also called spot instances, which yeah might uh, disconnect similar to the free version of Google Colab. Uh, but yeah, they basically allow you to get access to uh, a GPU quite easily. Um, and so, yeah, this is actually uh, getting very affordable now. Uh, so if you want to do the supervised fine tuning step, I would recommend to check uh, one of these out. Of course, you could also go to one of your uh, cloud providers like uh, Google Cloud also provides uh, GPU and AWS and Azure uh, do as well. And so in terms of software, uh, I would recommend to take a look at the TRL library. TRL is short for Transformers Reinforcement Learning. Um, and so the TRL library provides a handy SFT trainer class. So the SFT trainer class is a um, class that allows you to easily take one of the models from Hugging Face, one of the base models, and then you yeah, provide it with a certain data set and uh, you can then do uh, the supervised fine tuning. And it works out of the box uh, on one or more GPUs, so you don't need to change any code for that. And it also includes support for things like deep speed. Um, and another very nice feature of uh, the TRL library is that it includes support for PEFT. So PEFT uh, is actually another library developed by Hugging Face. Uh, PEFT is short for parameter efficient fine tuning because yeah, as these models become so large, it becomes quite impossible to train them on uh, one or multiple GPUs. But luckily there are some clever techniques like LoRa, which is one of the most uh, popular uh, parameter efficient fine tuning methods. Uh, and this basically allows us to fine tune these models on consumer hardware, like a single RTX 4090 GPU, for example. Um, and this is through a method called QLoRa. Uh, so QLoRa is short for quantized LoRa. And the idea here is that instead of taking our base model and um, fine tuning it all together, where we are updating all of the weights, uh, we rather simply freeze the pre-trained weights so we are not changing or updating these. We keep them unchanged, but we only add a few adapter layers, which are like additional parameters that we're going to fine tune. And so, yeah, this allows us to, to, uh, to do this on consumer hardware. And so this is all integrated into the TRL library. So we can, for example, just provide the use PEFT uh, flag uh, or for example, the load in four bit flag. Uh, and this, yeah, allows us to do QLara uh, very easily. And it now also uh, includes support for Unslot. Uh, so Unslot is another very nice uh, open source library um, that allows us to train or fine tune these models even faster uh, and with less memory. Um, and so, yeah, they do provide like custom implementations of open source models like Mistral or Llama. Um, and yeah, they have developed uh, some custom kernels in Triton to make sure that the training goes even faster. Uh, and so this is now also integrated into TRL. So I definitely recommend to check it out. Um, Hugging Face TRL. So, so that's the second step. So we had the pre-training step where we simply predict the next token. Then we have the supervised fine tuning stage where we uh, ask the model to uh, generate a useful completion on a human instruction. Um, and then the third step uh, is human preference training. So once we have a chatbot, uh, it could still like generate harmful content. It might not be the safest thing to uh, deploy. So that's where this third step uh, comes into play. So here we are going to take the chatbot that we trained in the second step, but we are going to make sure that it's safe, that it's friendly, uh, and that it's helpful. Um, 
so yeah this is nicely summarized in this meme over here so yeah the unsupervised learning stage where we take text from the web and ask the model to predict the next token uh yeah then the model might might generate some uh, offensive things things that we don't want just because yeah there's some so many harmful things on the web um so then we have the supervised fine-tuning step where we take the base model and turn it into a chatbot but it might still yeah, generate harmful content uh, because um, yeah, we don't have like any additional safety taken into account. And so this third step, the human preference step here, it's uh, dubbed RLHF, which is short for reinforcement learning from human feedback, is going to make sure that uh, the chatbot also uh, uh, is a friendly one. So that's why we have this smiley over here. So again, here, this is doable on your uh, local system, so it could be done on war, one or more G GPUs, and the size in terms of data set is in the few tens to uh, hundreds, thousands of examples. And so here, uh, in terms of data set, we require what is called human preferences. So here we basically, again, require some humans. So again, OpenAI has hired human contractors for this. Um, to basically say which answer they prefer from two completions from a given model. So basically, we give it a certain uh, instruction, then we take our supervised fine-tuned model and we generate, we ask it to generate two different completions, and then a human needs to uh, indicate which of the two completions he prefers. So we always will have uh, pairs of a chosen completion versus a rejected completion. And again, this is also available in Hugging Face, so you can find this. Um, for example, there is the, the one from Entropic. Uh, so this is, again, a collection of a chosen versus rejected um, pairs. And so in terms of uh, software, again, TRL provides a very handy trainer class for this. Um, so the method that we are going to use to optimize our model against these human preferences is called DPO or Direct Preference Optimization, which was a paper released by Stanford in 2023. Uh, but there are some other methods like PPO, um, which uh, is a very popular method in reinforcement learning. Um, and so, yeah, DPO is a newer method that basically uh, combines um, reward modeling and reinforcement learning, which uh, were used uh, previously by OpenAI. Um, but DPO is a newer method that uh, allows us to directly optimize our supervised fine-tuned chatbot uh, on the human preference data, whereas PPO, which was a method that came before it, uh, required us to first train a separate reward model, which mimics the human preference, and then we can optimize the chatbot uh, against this reward model. And so, yeah, DPO is also available uh, in Hugging Face TRL. So if you go here to the TRL docs, you will find um, the documentation of the DPO trainer. Um, and yeah, there are some very handy classes like DPO trainer, which allows you to very easily do this on your own custom human preference data to make sure that you basically steer the model in the direction that you want it to be, like whether you want it to be safe, friendly, uh, and so on. Now, uh, actually, I really recommend to check out the Hugging Face Alignment Handbook, which is an open source GitHub repository that includes scripts and recipes for all of the things that I explained here, both for supervised fine tuning and human preference training with DPO or direct preference optimization. Um, so yeah, the alignment handbook by Hugging Face um, basically explains how the Zephyr model was uh, created. So Zephyr uh, 7b is a fine-tuned version of the Mistral 7b uh, model from Mistral.ai um, with this additional supervised fine-tuning and DPO on top. Um, and so there are some very nice and also minimal scripts available um, which yeah, allow you to reproduce this uh, and it's even possible on a single rtx 4090 with these newer methods like q lora uh, and so yeah i really recommend to check out these scripts they are very very nice very minimal uh, so they're also really nice for uh, for educational purposes 
All right, so that's for training these uh, large language models. Okay, suppose you've trained these models, so you've done the supervised fine-tuning step and optionally also the DPO or human preference fine-tuning step. Next step is to deploy these models. Uh, make sure that you have like an endpoint that you can send requests to. Uh, here, uh, I would say there's mainly a distinction between serverless versus dedicated. Uh, deployments. So uh, by serverless, we basically mean that your model is running on shared hardware. It's shared uh, with other people, with other companies, uh, and you're only charged for uh, the amount of data that you send through it. So a typical example of a serverless solution is the OpenAI SDK. So OpenAI uh, has this chat completions API, uh, which basically allows you to just send some requests. Like in this case, uh, you instantiate the GPT 3.5 turbo model. You uh, have a certain amount of messages uh, that you send through it, and then you basically get a response back. Uh, but here, yeah, this GPT 3.5 turbo is running on some server, but yeah, you are not, uh, yeah, you don't need to take care, care of any of that. You are just charged for the amount of tokens that you send through the model and then you get a response back. Um, so that that's what we call serverless. And so there are a few uh, key players here, like for example, there is together.ai, there is anyscale, there is perplexity.ai, and all of, these, um, all of these companies, they allow you to uh, deploy your model in a serverless way, very similar to the OpenAI uh, API. So here, for example, uh, they actually also support the OpenAI SDK. So they basically allow you to simply swap the OpenAI models with an open source model, like for example, the Mixer model from uh, Mistral.ai, or I assume also your custom uh, trained open source model. And then you can use it in the exact same way uh, as with the OpenAI models uh, in the same serverless way. But so note that in this case, uh, the hardware on which your model is running is not uh, only assigned to you, it's being shared with other people and you're only charged for the amount of tokens that you send through it. And actually, a lot of these providers now already provide um, SDKs um, where the pricing is, is just much cheaper uh, per 1000 tokens uh, than the one offered by OpenAI, for example. Uh, I think Together's.ai solution, for example, is already 60% cheaper for mixed roles A times 7B than uh, GPT 3.5. So yeah, there was actually a funny race in December between these companies trying to uh, put down the cost uh, per 1 million tokens. So first there was Mistral.ai, which launched their pricing, then was Together.ai, which made it uh, cheaper to uh, 60 cents per 1 million tokens. And uh, now it's already down to uh, 0 0.27 dollars per 1 million tokens. And so given that we know that this mixtural model is already being preferred over GPT 3.5 Turbo in the chatbot arena, um, yeah, it's definitely worth taking a look at, at these models nowadays. So yeah, this is about the serverless solution. So the other uh, end of the spectrum is dedicated deployments. So in the case of a dedicated uh, deployment, it means that yeah, you basically own the machine or the the machine is only being assigned to you. Um, so this might be uh, required, for example, if you don't want to, your data to be shared with others and you really want to make sure that your data stays private. In that case, it might make sense to go for a dedicated uh, deployment. So here, my two main recommendations in terms of software are uh, TGI, which is short for Text Generation Inference from Hugging Face and VLLM. Um, which is developed, I think, at Berkeley. Um, and so these are yeah, some very nice um, open source frameworks for uh, deploying large language models. So for example, TGI or text generation inference is developed in Rust. Uh, and it's basically a backend um, for large language models, which uh, comes with a huge amount of features, like for example, with uh, Tensor parallelism to make sure that it runs fast on multiple GPUs. It comes with token streaming, continuous batching of incoming requests, uh, and so on. It comes with quantization, so allows you to shrink down the size of these models. It comes with optimizations like flash attention, 
uh, and so on. And so VLLM is a very similar one, um, which is a very nice open source backend basically for uh, serving LLMs. So yeah, this is my recommendation if you would go with a dedicated deployment, because in that case you can deploy either TGI or VLLM uh, on a dedicated instance. Uh, another solution here is inference endpoints, uh, which is a no, no code uh, solution, you could say, from Hugging Face. So it basically allows you uh, to deploy a model from the Hugging Face hub, uh, be it a public one or a private one, um, with a few clicks. So you basically just need to specify here, I want to deploy, for example, a mixture model. Um, and then on your cloud provider of choice, you can select uh, an instance with one or more GPUs attached to it. And then, yeah, you can uh, decide the security level of every endpoint. And then it's just a matter of creating your uh, endpoint. Uh, and so in, in case of dedicated uh, deployments, yeah, you are charged not for the amount of data that you send to it, but for the amount of time that the instance is running. Uh, so inference endpoints, for example, also comes with scaling down to zero ability, which means that yeah, you're only paying for the amount of time that the instance is running, but the instance automatically scales down to zero when there is no uh, usage, when there are no requests. So as I said, uh, this is charged per time. Let's say, for example, $2 per hour. Then um, after deploying, uh, let's come to the discussion of like why you might choose an open source uh, model over a closed source one. Well, there are a few advantages and there are a few disadvantages. So I would say the main advantages here is that, of course, data privacy. So there's no sensitive data being sent to another party. This is also why this private GPT uh, project or projects like Llama C++, uh, which is another one, uh, are very popular because yeah, they basically allow you to have a 100% private GPT assistant model. Uh, you also have full access to the model, so you also know what the model has been trained on. Uh, you have insights into that, which is not the case with closed source models. We don't really know on which data they have been trained. You don't really know uh, if a model gets updated and whether your prompt will still still work fine. It allows you to do fine tuning, as I explained in my previous slides, uh, using software tools like TRL, you can do the supervised fine tuning uh, and the human preference training yourself on one or more GPUs. Uh, you can then also yeah, de deploy them on the edge, for example, with frameworks like GGML, uh, MLX, which is a new framework from Apple. Um, and yeah, this this is kind of a meme, but uh, for example, with GPT-4, uh, people have uh, said that it has become a bit lazy. Uh, so apparently uh, a few months back, GPT-4 was really eager at like generating all of the uh, stuff that you wanted. But lately, uh, apparently it has become a bit lazy. Uh, and so for the same prompts that worked a few months back, uh, now it's just gen generating things like um, yeah, code to be filled in, uh, rather than generating the code itself. Um, so that's, of course, one other uh, disadvantage of, of a closed source solution is that, yeah, it might be that your prompts that worked a few months back uh, might now require an update uh, because you don't really have control over the model. Um, but of course, open source also comes with some disadvantages. Uh, I, s I would say the biggest one is uh, out of the box performance might not be as good as a closed source solution. This is also what you see, for example, in the chatbot arena leaderboard. Um, so I think an open source solution mainly makes sense if you uh, also start doing some fine tuning, unless you want to uh, have a solution, for example, a rack solution, a retrieval augmented uh, generation, which is also quite popular nowadays with open uh, source large language models. Uh, but yeah, unless there are these stronger models like, like Mixtrol and Mistral 7B, it might be that you, you definitely need to do some fine tuning before, before using them. Uh, and also regarding deployment, uh, this is definitely going to come with some learning curves, but, uh, it might be, uh, worth, especially, uh, in the long run. So yeah, this is a meme that I saw on the internet uh, regarding GPT-4 becoming lazy. Uh, like in this case, it's generate, uh, it generated, it works on my machine, but I actually think this 
it was probably just a meme. It's not uh, that GPT-4 has really generated this, but uh, OpenAI has actually acknowledged uh, the fact that uh, GPT-4 was becoming lazier. Um, so yeah, why why want, uh, do you want to uh, use a closed source solution? Well, of course, everything is handled for you. So that's definitely an advantage of using a closed source solution. You don't need to take care about deployment. Uh, you don't need to care about like training these models yourself. You can just pay for the amount of tokens that you send to it. Uh, so it will definitely work well out of the box. But um, yeah, you don't really have access uh, to to the underlying model. Uh, your prompts might require an update every few months. Uh, the model might become lazy as some people report it. Uh, you are also dependent on, on another party. Uh, there is a cutoff in terms of the data that it has been trained on. Uh, so yeah, as you don't really have access or insights into uh, what data the model has been trained on, uh, yeah, these are things you cannot really control. Um, so it might be that in the future we might have more and more uh, companies using smaller open source models, but then fine-tuned on their own data, uh, deployed in their own uh, infrastructure, making sure that uh, everything stays private and companies have control over them. Um, so in terms of exciting developments for the future, I think you might expect uh, large language models to become much smaller. Uh, like for example, with the Phi2 uh, model that was recently also made available on the Hugging Face. Uh, by Microsoft, so expect these models to, to run on a toaster, uh, you could say, uh, in a few months to a few years, uh, because there are a lot of uh, impressive uh, compression techniques being developed uh, every every few days by people like uh, Tim Detmers, who uh, is the person behind the QLoRa uh, method. So also I expect models like Mixtrol, which has this mixture of experts architecture uh, that people might be uh, able to come up with some very clever compression techniques uh, over the next few months as well. So yeah, expect a lot of these models to not only become smaller, but also become a lot more capable uh, and run a lot faster. Uh, this was another very interesting uh, study from Microsoft where they uh, were outperforming uh, a previous iteration of uh, GPT-4 just by including some very clever prompting techniques. Uh, which was able to get a performance of 90% on the MMLU benchmark. Uh, so yeah, this is another exciting development. So I would say, personally, uh, I would just sit back and enjoy this, this race between open and closed source solutions. I personally would not have expected that by the end of 2023, we would already have models that are preferred over GPT 3.5. Uh, I remember reading the the initial letter letter from Mistral.ai um, when they were um, uh, writing down their their investment uh, letter, and yeah, well, I was not really believing that by the end of 2023 they would already outperform GPT 3.5. Uh, but yeah, now now it's already the case. So I think by by this year we might have uh, an openly available model that uh, is getting close in performance of might even outperform GPT 4. Uh, we will see uh, how that happens, but it's definitely very interesting to see the race. And of course, there's there's much more to come. Uh, large language models are just one uh, piece of technology, one kind of architecture, but Hugging Face, of course, supports many more uh, architectures. Uh, so, for example, we recently also uh, support the Lava and Buck Lava uh, models, which are multimodal extensions of large language models. Uh, so they also can take in uh, vision inputs besides text. So then you can basically give it an image uh, and ask a certain question related to that image and the model will be able to generate an answer similar to uh, GPT-4 with vision and so on. So also there we might see a lot of uh, exciting developments. Um, but yeah, as you can see right here, uh, Hugging Face is really modality agnostic. So we're not focused on language alone. We do support all kinds of different tasks like related to computer vision, related to audio, like with the distal whisper models, for example, which are distilled versions of the whisper speech recognition models from OpenAI. Uh, we do support multimodal applications. 
like document question answering and so on. So yeah, expect a lot of these uh, models uh, to appear in the new feature as well. And yeah, don't focus on large language models uh, only, of course. So yeah, that was it uh, for my talk. Thanks uh, for watching this video and uh, I hope you learned something and I hope uh, that you will also sit back and enjoy the race uh, as I will do. Bye-bye.